There's been some dispute. Uh, good evening, by the way. Uh, should wear seatbelts tonight because we're going to be uh, on quite a ride over the next uh, day or so, and I'll see what I can do to enlighten us about that prospect. Uh, one of the issues is whether the, what we have before us is Ryan Care, the Speaker of the House, or Trump Care. But uh, Donald Trump has now, in a number of times, said, I'm 100% behind this. So he's taking ownership entirely uh, of this process, although I dare say he doesn't really know much about what's in it, uh, <laughs> other than the desire uh, to make it happen. His baseline, uh, what the table shows are the number of seats that the President's party, or, or these nine first-term Presidents, had in the House of Representatives. And the next column, what I call solid votes, are the number of votes that you would get on average in those years based on how often those party members stuck together on votes. And what you see is that the Republican majority in the House, which is actually a little smaller than 241, there's some vacancies, is uh, not an astonishing large majority, uh, but they have been sticking together pretty well over the last several years. And so there is a working Republican majority in the House, and one that's quite ideologically coherent, which is why when I was here two months ago, I fully expected the House to uh, enact whatever uh, the Speaker was going to come up with. If you look on the Senate side, you'll also see that the Republican majority of 52 in the Senate is a really very small and narrow majority compared to these, to these other past presidents. And when you look at how often they stick together on average, they really do not have a working even majority in the Senate, much less a supermajority. And just to recall that when President Obama was able to enact the Affordable Care Act, uh, in a sense, by the skin of his chinny chin chin at the time, it was with considerably better numbers in the Senate than uh, Republicans have right now. And what uh, President Trump is confronting, Republicans are confronting, is to actually even just get the majority on the reconciliation bill will require a level of unity that they have not achieved on average at any time in the past. So we'll see how uh, well that works out. And of course, when it comes to having to pass something uh, over a filibuster outside of reconciliation, it requires 60 votes. And I'll talk a little bit about the significance of that. This is Speaker Paul Ryan, and he's presenting to the press the overall, what he called, three-pronged strategy for how they wanted to repeal and replace Obamacare. The first is through this reconciliation process that Jerry talked about. Uh, reconciliation, as Jerry mentioned, provides protection in the Senate. You may not filibuster a reconciliation bill, uh, and therefore you only need a simple majority, so you only need uh, what would turn out to be 50 votes in the Senate because Vice President Mike Pence can cast the deciding vote. Uh, but the problem with reconciliation, as Jerry mentioned, is you can't include everything in it. It can only be measures that are directly related to revenues or expenditures, and under the so-called Byrd Rule, any other provision can be uh, 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 presented as out of order uh, on the Senate floor and bring the whole thing to a stop. And so the Republicans have to be very cautious about what they put in the reconciliation bill because it could simply be blocked in the Senate by putting in things that could be challenged. The second part of the prong is what they call administrative action. Here, Secretary of Health and Human Services Tom Price has promised that the department would do all kinds of things to stabilize the health insurance market uh, following the enactment of the, America, uh, the uh, American Health Care Act. Uh, and that, that would allow uh, them to move on to the third prong, which is what uh, is here presented as additional information, ad additional legislation. And additional legislation is to capture all the things that they can't do in the reconciliation bill. And that's going to get very complicated, as I'll talk about in a moment. And well, I should say that uh, even on the reconciliation, there are complications, as I'm going to mention a bit more in a moment. The Freedom Caucus has about 30 members, most of whom have indicated that they're going to vote no uh, tomorrow if it comes up. And in the Senate, there are three senators, Cruz, Lee, and Paul, who have already said they're against uh, the bill because they, they identify the bill as an uh, overly expansive Obamacare light uh, entitlement program. Uh, when you come to the additional legislation, the trick here, of course, is they're gonna, if they're going to pass something, they're going to need all 52 senators plus eight Democrats, at least eight Democrats. And they want to get those Democrats to support things like getting rid of essential benefits requirements. Uh, to get rid of the preventive care coverage without a copay, and to get things like opening up uh, plan comp uh, competition across state lines, which is, we can go into this later, a particularly unlikely uh, uh, prospect for working in the health insurance system. Now, one of the complaints that uh, Secretary Price has is CBO, uh, the Congressional Budget Office, has been scoring the reconciliation bill, but not these two other things. 
And of course, the EBO can't score them because they don't exist. <laughs> There's nothing to calculate costs uh, around, and so those have not, not been part of the discussion yet. Okay. Uh, CBO on March 13th did issue its scoring of the or original version of the American Health Care Act, and my understanding is sometime tonight they are going to issue their recalculation of the scoring of the, uh, the new version that, as Jerry discussed it. And of course, others have also been trying to ascertain what the impact would be of the American Health Care Act if it were to be passed into law. Uh, the first thing that is very well known is what Jerry uh, and others have already mentioned, which is uh, quite immediately there would be an expansion of about 14 million uninsured in the first year, then up to 24 million uninsured, or what otherwise what Paul Ryan has described as freedom. Uh, <laughs> it is a significant and dramatic shift, and of course this has many moderates in Congress, including the Republican Party, quite worried. Uh, the uh, increases in the uninsured come from ending the individual mandate, the tax penalty, come from ending the mandate on large employers, uh, come from reductions in the subsidies through the tax credits, which will mean fewer people will be able to afford insurance and therefore won't take up the tax credit. But the big bulk comes from Medicaid. And as you can see, the increase in the uninsured in Medicaid is dramatic, large, uh, and uh, persistent uh, as we go forward. Now, uh, it does save money, the American Health Care Act. Uh, it will reduce the budget deficit by $337 billion in the scoring, although that's going to actually disappear pretty soon uh, because there, uh, uh, the, the change has been made in the bill. What happens is uh, they are reducing by expenditures by $1.2 trillion in the bill, but reducing revenues by $883 uh, billion. And just to give you a sense of where that money is, uh, most of the revenue savings are actually going, as Jerry mentioned, uh, to the more affluent. In fact, the one analysis I read suggested that about 60% of the revenue savings from the first two categories up there go to millionaires. So this is a, a, a significant redistribution back to the top. Uh, and then, of course, the major reductions are primarily in the almost $900 billion cuts in the Medicaid program. Uh, one of the things about these tax credits as opposed to the subsidies, that Jerry, as Jerry mentioned, because it's based only on age, uh, not on income or location, uh, means that uh, if you're low income, uh, your, uh, the net premium you're going to have to pay for coverage, particularly as you get older, would be much higher under this new bill. Uh, and if you are uh, quite wealthy, it uh, means you have to pay considerably less in net premiums uh, as a result of uh, passage of the act if it happens. This is the distribution of the impact uh, on ta the changing uh, from, the tax, from the ACA subsidies to the tax credits. And a couple things to highlight. Uh, first of all, it's pretty good for uh, more affluent young. Now, the fact that these folks tend to vote more democratic is kind of an interesting political strategy on their part, but uh, uh, <laughs> as long as you're not a poor 27-year-old, uh, you do quite well. The next thing to notice is you do quite well, uh, the, as Jerry mentioned, the higher you go up you go in the income spectrum. Uh, quite interestingly, uh, one place that does really well is Santa Monica. So I'm sure that's a relief to all of you. <laughs> <laughs> the average so increase today, in Santa Monica now, in the tax uh, uh, provision for you would be $6,000. So this is a good benefit for um, us out here in the west side of LA. Uh, not so good <laughs> if you are in the uh, pre-Medicare uh, age group and not uh, tremendously uh, wealthy. This is really where you take a significant hit, although this is where changes in the bill. Uh, there's supposed to be something like $150 billion, I've heard. Uh, that the Senate is then supposed to decide how it goes to uh, uh, help support uh, uh, people who are in their more uh, later years in life and don't have a lot of money. Okay, uh, you can also, I'll go through this very quickly, that's a map of the U United States. The red states are, have two uh, Republican senators. The blue states have two <coughs> Democratic senators, purple one uh, Democrat, one Republican, and the stripes are the independents, but of course the independents are caucusing with the Democrats. Just to give you a sense of what this looks like, a 27-year-old earns $20,000 a year uh, is um, uh, not going to do well. And that's, that's going to be true across the country, including Republican states. A 40-year-old earns $30,000 a year, better, but you can still see there are a lot of areas where people are going to do worse. That's the blue under the new act if it's enacted. If you're a 60-year-old at $20,000, uh, almost all across the country people do worse. If you even earn 40000 still all across the country, including in Republican states, states with Republican governors. So overall, the so-called red states, uh, the Republican states, people, uh, on average do worse under this act than they do under the ACA. Now, uh, 
This is done by Nate Cohn at the Upshot of the New York Times. It's, it's, it could be prone to a lot of uh, measurement error and what we call ecological fallacy, but he tried to calculate based on survey data from the Cooper Congressional Election Study and the Kaiser Family Foundation's calculations of the tax uh, credit impacts, who would be uh, affected. And what you see is uh, at the top, that has to do with buying in the individual insurance market. And you see the top, the top four losing groups are either more likely to have supported Trump than not, or uh, just about even. And of the Medicaid uh, beneficiaries, uh, it, it's a little bit hedged. Uh, uh, Trump supporters are more likely to be in states that are also going to be damaged by the uh, American Health Care Act. So it actually is in many ways targeting uh, their own constituency, uh, just to make that highlighted. Um, now, this is the Medicaid expansion states, uh, 31 states plus the District of Columbia. These are the Republican expansion states. And by Republican, I mean they currently have Republican governors, governors who are really on a day-to-day -day basis responsible for what happens in their states and uh, how one has to manage the system. Uh, these four states, their governors actually wrote letters uh, to uh, Speaker Ryan and, and uh, Senate Majority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell indicating their opposition to the American Health Care Act, and they've also written to their congressional delegations. This shows you the number of Republican senators uh, who are in the expansion states, a considerable number, so this is something they're going to really have to think about if the issue moves on to the Senate. These are the vulnerable Democrats, the most vulnerable Democrats, and there are some, so that might go on the other side, although so far the 10 most vulnerable Democrats uh, ten, uh, come from states up in the next election that Trump carried are all in uniform opposition to this act. So they're not going to be uh, easy pickings for the Republicans. Um, and then uh, two, three other things blowing uh, against the political dynamics for the Amer American Health Care Act. These are the groups in opposition, a whole bunch of liberal groups, but also, as was already mentioned by Alexander, uh, the AARP and Families USA. Basically, all the healthcare industry <laughs> Pretty much. Yes. are in opposition from the docs to the nurses to the hospitals to the Catholic Hospital Association to the nursing homes and to the right wing parties, uh, the right wing organizations Freedom Caucus, Tea Party, Club of Growth, Cato Institute, and Heritage Foundation. So that's a pretty good coalition if it's not against you. Uh, a second uh, thing that's, uh, I'll be wrapping up very quickly. The second thing that is uh, pu uh, pushing against is the, these are the latest Donald Trump numbers, not quite the latest from a couple of days ago. That top line is not his approval rating, that's his disapproval. Uh, Trump made history by hitting the 50% mark in eight days uh, compared to hundreds of days and over thousands of days. And it's actually hovered around where it is right now. Now, if you're a Republican senator, you're looking at that and realizing there's not a lot of political juice behind the president right now, which is why his work with the House Republicans has not had huge impact. On the other hand, you have to realize the president still has support of 86% of Republicans. So if you're thinking about your Republican base and not wanting to be primary, as they say, that's an issue. On the other hand, if you're worried about the general election, the president's approval among independents is at 35%. For Democrats, it's around 10%. So uh, the third thing, which I don't have up here, but I showed last time, is in fact the, Amer the Affordable Care Act has achieved a greater level of popularity and support today than it's had since it was enacted. <laughs> That's correct. I think as the stories that come out of uh, what people experience. So tomorrow we go to the House, maybe. They may pull the bill, because right now CNN in the count has at least 27 Republicans, they can lose 21, has 27 Republicans saying no. Uh, the New York Times' latest count has 27 plus another uh, dozens or so who are uh, uh, leaning negative or are very much undecided. So it's really up in the air. And then there's the Senate. The Senate plays into the House. There's something called being BTU. In 1993, when President Clinton had his Budget Act, he wanted to tax British thermal units as an energy savings provision. And the House, after a lot of arm twisting, went along with it. The Senate then did not. So all those House members who went out on a limb and had a vote on a hard issue eventually got really politically uh, tarred as a result. So nobody in the House today wants to be BTU. Uh, and they're worried about if the Senate's not going to act, why would I go forward? Now, the Senate, we have no idea when or how or what. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, or at least I'm going to suggest to you right now, uh, I will be the UCLA optimist for those of you who want to see the ACA continue 
I think it's going to continue. I don't think they've got the traction to go forward. And if the Republicans are unable to get a successful vote in the House, it's going to be really quite extraordinary in its impact on what the President and Republicans can do at that stage. So thank you very much.